on page 281. And we're going to sing this to the tune Newington, number 123. And I think we can often see the sins of other people. We can see the faults in society at large. We can see the problems that there are in the world. And indeed, this series that we're just starting today is thinking about problems. But we do need to spend time thinking about how great God is. Praising God for who he is and how faithful he is. Counting the blessings that are ours because of his covenant towards us. And the opening stanzas of this psalm do lift God up and do encourage us in, in many different ways and with many different words to praise God, to bless him. And then the closing stanzas, stanzas four and five, show us how involved God is, especially with those who don't get help from any other. Jesus comes, we see word about princes, the princes of his people. Well, Jesus is the prince of the universe. And yet he dies for his people when we were powerless, when we were ungodly, when we were still sinners. So for these reasons, because God is great and also because God is gracious, let's praise his name together. Psalm 113a. And we'll keep our seats and praise God. together as we come to talk to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today for the freedom we have to come together like this on the first day of the week, whenever the disciples met in the upper room, whenever the risen Jesus appeared among them to give them courage and hope. And Father, we come to you today through Jesus and through the work he has done on the cross to bring us back to you. We thank you that we have voices to praise your name as we've just been doing. We thank you that we have minds that can think about you, that can take in some of the things you say in your word. We thank you for this world which is not perfect, which can be cruel and difficult, but which is still your world and shows us much about you. You are the one who keeps this world turning towards the sun and away again every day so that we have night and day, so that it looks, as we've just been singing, as if the sun is rising and setting. 
And Father, it's you who keeps this world going around the sun so that we have seasons of autumn and winter and spring and summer. We thank you that you are beyond this world, that you are beyond all you have made so that the troubles of this world do not shake your throne. Father, we need to ask you to forgive us today. We don't always take time to praise you, to think about the many ways that you're involved in our lives. You know that we can waste so much of our time on what doesn't last. Lord, you know that the other day some of us were thinking in class about Haman, a man obsessed with wiping out your people. He thought he had risen so high, and yet in one day, all he had worked for was taken away. He lost his position, he lost his family, he lost his life. Forgive us whenever we lose sight of you. Forgive us, Father, when we even read your word and don't take it in. It doesn't really speak to us. That's not the fault of your word. That's the fault of our hearts. We do pray that by your spirit, you would help us to be more ready to hear you, the great king, the great lover of your people, the great Lord, and help us in hearing you. Help us to want to love you and to serve you. Father, we do thank you for Jesus today. We thank you that he, the prince of the universe, was ready to become poor, was ready to give up his own life so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be raised up to the place where you want us to be, so that we might become your children so that we might have a home with you in heaven. And Father, we pray that we may have the blessing, not just of seeing our physical children growing up, but that we may be able to see people whose lives we're involved in, owning up to their sin and giving their lives to the loving and risen Saviour for now and for eternity. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the New Testament. And I want to read three different passages from the New Testament. And we're thinking the subject today is working through worry. So these passages have to do with the subject of worry. The first of them is Matthew chapter 6, at verse 25. Just thinking about the very end of this passage, Jesus is speaking about two different days at the end of this passage. How does what he says about these days help us with our worry? When worry crowds in, We're encouraged to focus on God, on Jesus, on his love. And that will give us all we need. Is there anything, is there anything that we should worry about? That's what we'll see in the the second passage that we'll read together. First of all, Matthew chapter 6, at verse 25. This is God's word. Therefore, Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor 
was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And then turning over to Paul's letter to the Philippians and chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This is on page 1233 of the Maroon Bibles. I just want to read a paragraph from verse 10. And as Paul writes these words, he's sitting in prison. Philippians chapter 4 at verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And then finally, if you turn back with me to Mark chapter 10. And could I ask Samuel and Thomas and Lydia particularly to listen to this passage? We have here two men who are worrying. But I want to read the first few verses before that. So Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 32, to find out what they're actually worrying about. Mark 10 at verse 32. They, that is Jesus and the disciples, were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Amen. May God bless to us these readings from his own perfect and powerful truth. Just talking to... Samuel and Thomas and Lydia, just for a minute. We were talking about Jonah last week, if you can remember some of the things that we were saying. Can you remember how many chapters there are in the book of Jonah? Samuel. Remember I held up a number. Thomas was able to read the number. 
4, that's right. And there's actually four different parts of Jonah that God wants to get. Can you remember some of the parts of Jonah that God wanted to get? Yes, Samuel. Well, but that's, we're going to come to that. That's right. That's the very last one and, in fact, the most important one. But I'll talk first about his mind. God wanted to get Jonah's mind to think about the, the fact that he's everywhere and that Jonah needed to obey him. And then the second thing God wanted to get was Jonah's will inside the great fish. Jonah wanted to trust God. Jonah wanted to confess his sin. Jonah wanted to do the right thing. So Jonah's mind, Jonah's will. And then the third thing, God got Jonah's body. Whenever Jonah did actually go in his body to the place, the big city, that God told him to go to. And he told the people quite a sad message that the city was going to be destroyed unless they turned from their sin and came back to God. But as you quite rightly said, the most important of all is God wanted Jonah's heart. Jonah loved the plant because it was giving him shade. It grew up in a day. And yet Jonah loved the plant. God wanted Jonah to love him and trust him because he loves people everywhere. And God wanted Jonah out of love to tell other people about him. And he wants us to do the same. So those are four things. It's good to remember those four things from Jonah. And God wants our hearts. God wants us to love Jesus most of all. Let's just talk for a minute or two about that passage we've just read, the last passage. And Jesus has just told his disciples very hard things. This is not the first time. It's not the second time, it's actually the third time he's told his disciples about this. What's going to happen to him in Jerusalem? They're going to put him to death. And this has surprised and this has shaken all the disciples. Jesus is going to be killed. They thought Jesus was going to be king. So if Jesus is going to be killed, what's going to happen to them? There we have James and John who come to Jesus and who ask Jesus a particular question. And what they're worried about, they're worried in their minds. If you're going to be killed, then maybe we're going to be scattered. Maybe your kingdom is not going to come at all. That's what they're worried about. And that's why they ask Jesus if they could have special seats in Jesus' kingdom. So they're worried. And Jesus is trying to help them with that worry. I don't think they heard Jesus' words at the end. Three days later, I will rise. I don't think they heard that. They heard all the bad things. They didn't hear the one good and glorious thing. In other words, there is a kingdom. It's all being prepared. It's going to happen. So don't worry, James. Don't worry, John, about the future. Concentrate on serving me now. And Jesus talked about a cup and about baptism. I'm not going to go into all of that, but there's the kind of cup he's talking about. Would you fancy picking up that cup? You see the thorns on it? That wouldn't be an easy cup to pick up or to drink from. And that's trying to show us that there was suffering ahead for Jesus. And Jesus said, James, John, if you follow me, if you trust me, then there's suffering ahead for you too. Other people might give you a hard time. Other people might not believe that I am the Messiah. Other people might be your enemies, but you must trust me. You must do what's right. And what he said was, I want you to serve me. That's what those two hands say. 
serve Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants from all of us. He doesn't want us to worry about years and years into the future and what might happen. He just wants us to be concentrating on today and thinking how we might serve him today. And really the message is the same as to do with Jonah. Jesus wants our hearts. The most important thing of all is that we are loved by Jesus. Because if Jesus has died for us and risen again, and if we're serving him, then nothing can come between us and him in this life or in the next life. So do you think about that? Do you think about the worry that James and John had? They were worried because they heard that Jesus was going to die. But Jesus told them that even that wasn't going to take them away from his kingdom. Even Jesus' death, God had planned to bring good, to bring forgiveness into our lives. And just now we're going to sing about that together. We're going to sing part of Psalm 94. It's on page 222 of the Psalm books. And it stands as 9 to 12 of Psalm 94. And this is quite a strong psalm. It says some quite strong things. It tells us, if you look at stanza 9, who will rise against the wicked? It tells us what Jesus was saying to James and John. There will be wicked people who will give you a hard time. But it's telling us that God is going to help those who are trusting in him. It's saying in stanza 10, when my anxious thoughts are many, how your comforts cheer my soul. So it's saying that God can help us in our worry. If we concentrate on God, God's love, God's comfort, God's help, God's presence, all of those things help us in difficult times. And if we're trusting in Jesus, if our sins are forgiven, if we are Jesus' friends by faith, then we have all we need. So let's sing Psalm 94, stanzas 9 to 12 together. And again, just keep our seats to the tune Hifridol 258. take up an offering, please don't forget the offering. The bag is over on the table and certainly uh, we will be pleased. Uh, God will be pleased if you will give to his work both here and elsewhere in the denomination. Let's again come to God in prayer. Let's stand as we pray. Mm -hmm. 
Our Father, we do thank you that Jesus was concerned and that Jesus is still concerned about all his followers. He is concerned for all his disciples. We do pray that you would help us to want to love Jesus and to serve him first. Because thinking about how to do that will take much worry out of our lives if we're concentrating on Jesus and not so much on the difficulties, on the problems we face. Help us to know and to believe that Jesus and you, Father, and the Holy Spirit know what you're doing, even if it doesn't always look that way. Help us to trust you when things are going well and to trust you when things are going badly too. You are not a friend. You are not a heavenly father who leaves us in bad times. You are with your people in the darkest valley. And Father, just now we want to pray for our prime minister and for his cabinet. You tell us in your word to pray for people in power. And we know that all kinds of people are putting pressure on for the Prime Minister to please them, to help them with their particular problems. We know that he was wanting to help his friend this past week, and that seemed to lead to difficulties in the House of Commons. We do pray that you would help the Prime Minister to understand that justice and right are not things that are invented, but that these are things that come from you. They are revealed in your word. We do pray that you would help him to see that even though he does have a certain amount of power, that you are in control, not him. We do pray that you would help him to bow the knee to you. We do realize that he does know you. He knows something about you. We pray that he would bow the knee to King Jesus. And so in that way, that he would seek to rule the nation aright. Father, you know that this subject of worry that we're coming to just now affects all of us. You know that we worry about different things. Things come in on top of us. They can pull us one way and another. They can tempt us to be double-minded. But help us to know that if we are in two minds, then as James would tell us in your word, then we are unstable in what we do. We pray that you would teach us from the words of Jesus and from the words of Paul to learn not to worry, to learn to trust you with all we have, because you are a good father and a dependable father for all your children. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please do have that second passage that we read together open in front of you to start with. That's the one from Philippians. Page 1233. My gran on my father's side, although she was a Christian, was an expert worrier. A comment was once made in the family that if she didn't have anything to worry about, she'd be worried. And worry is like that. Once you start to worry, the world is your oyster. You can worry about your health. You can worry about your family's health. You can worry about the state of our church, our denomination. You can worry about the state of the country. 
You can worry about the world itself. Are we going to be choked by pollution? Or will we be fried by global warming? What about the threat from Islamic terrorism? Or another virus arriving on our shores, more deadly than COVID-19? Two people may live next door to each other, and everything else about their lives is the same, except that one is a worrier and one is not, and so their lives are actually very different. One is uptight, while the other can be relaxed. You can even worry about something that's supposed to give you pleasure. When you're off on holiday, that will happen again. Holidays will happen again. Did we lock the back door? Do we have the tickets? Are you sure we're going to the right airport? What if there's some kind of incident at the airport? Will the place we're staying be all right? Will we be able to make ourselves understood? What if we get sick when we're away? Can we actually afford this holiday? And if all those kinds of things crowd in, some of them quite legitimate, a delight can turn into a worry. I want to introduce you to someone in the Bible who has plenty to worry about. We heard from him in that reading from Philippians chapter 4. It's the Apostle Paul. We can call this section Learning to be content because you'll see that Paul uses that word more than once. Learning. It's not something that comes naturally. We have to learn. It's almost as if we have to go back to school. Learning to be content. Before Paul became a Christian, he was probably a worrier. Have you ever wondered why Paul, or Saul as he was then, held the coats of those who were stoning Stephen? Is it because, although he was worried about this new Christian movement that Stephen was involved in, he was also worried about getting too caught up in what was really a lynching, what was really illegal. When Paul tried, again as Saul, to stamp out the early church himself, didn't he seek permission from the authorities to do so? He was following the legal route. But his actions in going as far away as Damascus to winkle out Christians show how worried he was by this new Jesus movement. Yet when the risen Jesus meets Saul on the road outside Damascus, he removes all those worries. And Saul discovers once and for all, Jesus is really alive. He is who he claimed to be. The Christian way is really true. And God wanted him to take this great news to the Gentiles, to the world. However, that exciting prospect really replaced one set of worries with another. The Christians were now his friends, but his former friends among the Jews were now his enemies. And as he sits in a prison cell in Rome, writing to the Christians in Philippi, he has plenty to worry about. He has appealed to Caesar, and he's waiting to appear before Nero, the most powerful man in the world. He hasn't been given a date for his trial. It could be the very next day, or it may be months away. The prison gives him no food. He eats only what friends bring in to him. He's in chains, and he's looking really at two possible outcomes. Nero may decide there's no case to answer, and so Saul or Paul now may be set free. Or 
he may be sentenced to be tortured and then put to death, either by being burned or by being beheaded. After all, Nero will blame the Christians for the fire he started in Rome. Yet look at what Paul writes here in verse 11 of Philippians 4. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. As I say, not worrying doesn't come naturally to Paul. Even as a Christian, he carried the burden of all the churches he had planted on his shoulders. In his travels on the Lord's business, he's been round many corners. Look at verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But this is his testimony. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He may well have been born a worrier, but in the most unpleasant, uncertain circumstances, he has learned the secret of unworried contentment. And we'll come back to that. We'll come back to Paul in prison later. But for now, let's turn to that other passage we read from the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 6. Page 1023. For here we have Paul's Lord and Master speaking. And we can call this section Do not worry about food or clothes. Do not worry about food or clothes. Verse 25 of Matthew 6. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? In the days when Jesus walked this earth, there were many people who were desperately poor. There was no welfare system in Israel. People often starved. Many were clothed in rags. Many had no roof over their heads, not even a cloak to wrap around them at night. It's hard for us to imagine such poverty. Yet Jesus says to these people in simple, plain words, do not worry about what you will eat, or about what you will wear. Do not worry about food or clothes. If he can say that to people for whom these are genuine concerns, these are basic needs, what would he say about what we worry about? I would suggest we probably worry about less basic things, like mortgages or medicines, homes or holidays, First world problems, as they've been called. Jesus' main point in this passage is that there is nothing people need to worry about. And his command covers everything. Look on down to verse 34. Jesus says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. As well as being strong in his command not to worry, Jesus is also very realistic. He doesn't pretend problems aren't there. He's saying in verse 34 that there's an amount of trouble we must face every day. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And Jesus knew that trouble himself. He was born into a poor working class home. It seems that Joseph, his earthly father, died 
when the family was still quite young, leaving Jesus, the oldest, to look after his brothers and sisters. He lived in a Jewish land occupied by Roman soldiers. So Jesus knows what he means when he says at the end of verse 34, each day has enough trouble of its own. He's not telling us to be careless, to act as if we couldn't care less. There's a difference between worry and concern. We're concerned if our children want to play near traffic. Concern thinks about the present, while worry is taken up with the future. None of us can control the future. That's why worry doesn't actually achieve anything, apart from giving us ulcers. That's the point of verse 27, where Jesus says, Who of you, by worrying, can add us? It's disputed whether he's talking about a single hour to his life, or a certain amount of height to where we already stand. We can't do these things. Worry doesn't work. Nor is Jesus telling us not to plan for the future. Jesus knew what lay ahead for him. Hasn't he told his disciples in that passage from Mark? It was all mapped out. His main point is, that we never need to worry, even about these most basic things. But let me just ask a question here. Who's Jesus talking to here? Who is the you? In verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Is he talking to everyone? Let's find out. I'm sure you know that verses 25 to 34 form one section of a larger sermon Jesus preached in the open air. And the whole sermon can be read in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Let's just go back to the start of the sermon for a moment, back to page 1020. Just look at what it says at the very start of Matthew chapter 5. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, So all that follows in chapter 5, in chapter 6, and in chapter 7 is directed at Jesus' disciples. That is, at those who had willingly put themselves under Jesus' control, those who thought of him as their Lord and Master, those who believed what he said and who wanted to obey him. Jesus is saying to those disciples, now that you belong to me, you don't need to worry about anything. In fact, I forbid you to worry. This is not a blanket statement for the whole world. This applies only to Jesus' own people. And to go back to chapter 6, what reason does Jesus give his people, his disciples, not to worry? Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? His reason for us not to worry, for believers not to worry, is because God is in control of everything. Haven't we seen that in recent weeks in Jonah? God's in control of the wind that catches Jonah's ship, of the great fish that saves Jonah from drowning, of the plant that gives Jonah shade as he sulks outside the city, and of the worm that eats through the roots of the plant. We've just been through the season of harvest, when many farmers can thank God for barns full of crops. 
where we used to live in Port Lanone, there were beech trees in the grounds. And at this time of the year, squirrels came to gather up the beech nuts. Because squirrels don't have any bank accounts. Squirrels can't go to the supermarket for food. And yet, out of his great generosity, God provides more than enough for these little animals and for birds, as Jesus says here, and for flowers too. Jesus goes on to talk about the lilies in verse 28. For a believer to worry in the face of such provision is surely unintelligent and unobservant too. Will God not much more feed you, his disciples, here today? Are you not much more valuable than the squirrels? Jesus didn't go to a cross to shed his blood for squirrels, for birds. Yet he did give his own life for every believer. Notice too what he says in verses 31 and 32. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And clearly here he's separating his disciples from those he calls the pagans. And maybe you have a problem here, which makes it hard to grasp Jesus' meaning. In verse 26, and again in verse 32, Jesus uses the words, your heavenly Father. Many people think, mistakenly, that we are all God's children. You sometimes hear people saying that on the radio, on the TV. That every human being can think of God as his or her heavenly Father. But that is not true. Yes, God has created every one of us. But the relationship between us and God has been broken on our side. By nature, we don't want God to be our Heavenly Father. We don't want to have to obey Him to do His will. We have wronged God, the one who provides us with everything. We have ignored Him and tried to push Him away. We don't do by nature what He commands. We don't honour Him or set aside time for Him. Instead, we have done what he hates. We have told lies. We have acted selfishly. We have treated others badly. Our family life, even with those we love most, hasn't been what it should. We have put other things in God's place. We have sinned against him. And a holy, loving God regards us as guilty for what we've done. He's angry with us. As the Psalms tell us, he is angry with the wicked every day. And we are wicked by nature. Again, contrary, contradicting what the world would tell you, we are wicked by nature, not good by nature. And God has sworn to punish our sins. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. This is the plain, unvarnished truth. Those whose, sins have, those whose sins have not been cleansed, who are not trusting in Jesus every day, have no claim on God as our Heavenly Father. What am I saying? What is God saying here? In Matthew 6, Jesus is telling his disciples not to worry about food or clothes or about anything else. But probably between the lines you could say, he's also saying here, do worry. If God is not your heavenly father, do worry if God is not your heavenly father. This is what unbelievers need to hear. This is what unbelieving friends and family members need to hear. 
if you're still in your sins, you have plenty to worry about. And while you remain that way, you have no cure for your worry. There's a great barrier between you and God caused by your sin. You're living under God's displeasure. And his anger against you is growing every day. Today is one day nearer to the day you'll die and stand before him. There's a rift between you and God. And that's a great thing for you to worry about. That's actually the explanation for all your other worries. You see, if you're not saved today, you've got no one you can trust to look after you. You have no Father in heaven. You have walked out on God. You're an orphan in a huge, frightening universe where anything can happen. That's where the problem of worry begins. You have lost God. And that's why Christians can worry too from time to time, because we think we've lost God, because for some reason we come adrift from where we should be. Even though this passage assures us and reassures us, if we're trusting in Jesus, we haven't lost God. But there is a way back to God for spiritual orphans. Just keep your finger in Matthew 7 and turn, turn over to John chapter 1 for a minute. These are verses that I'm sure you know well. It's good to, to come to them from time to time, just to remind us of some basic truths. Page 1115, John chapter 1. Now these verses are often read around Christmas time, but they're helpful now as well. Verse 11. He, that is Jesus, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is the one that these verses are talking about. Jesus was and is God's one and only eternal Son. He was with the Father before God created anything. This world was made through Jesus. He is its rightful owner. And these verses tell of a time when Jesus came into this world. He became a real human being. He lived a perfect life. He pleased his Father in every way. He came to his own place. But his own people rejected him and nailed him to a cross to die in agony. On that cross, God the Father punished his own son for the sins of others. He treated his own son like a criminal so that he can treat criminals like us as his children. That's the great exchange that we've seen before many times. That's what's going on on the cross. God's anger against sinners is satisfying. God's love for sinners is demonstrated. There Jesus paid the price for my sins. He opened up the way for me to be accepted as a child of God, to be adopted into his family by faith. So before you can deal with the problem of worry, you have to deal with the problem of your sin. If you come across people who are worried, you need to tell them that. Before you can sort out what you're worrying about, you need to get your sin sorted out. You must go to God and tell him how wrongly you have treated him. You must ask this God to forgive you for Jesus' sake and make you one of his children. And then God will be your heavenly Father and that will change everything. Can you
you remember how as a small child you believed that your mum knew everything, that your dad could do anything. And then when you grew up, you found that wasn't actually true. But when you become a real Christian, then you have God as your heavenly Father. And he does know everything. As we saw last Lord's Day evening, he is everywhere at once. He can fix anything. And he loves you, believer, with an everlasting love. For the sake of Jesus. He will listen when you bring any problem to him in Jesus' name. And if God is now your Heavenly Father, and I know that that's true for most of us here today, if God is your Heavenly Father, then I want us to be going out, to be reaching out to others, so that they may come in, so that they may find a Heavenly Father, a Saviour, a friend for all seasons. And that's why Paul can rest in peace in his prison cell. Let's just come back to Philippians 4 to finish. Again, page 1, 2, 3, 3. And that's why Paul can write a couple of verses that we didn't read earlier. If you look just a little bit up the, the page to verse 6, what Paul says in verse chapter 4, verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What he's doing here is he's telling Christians to be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. My mother is ill. Be anxious for nothing. My job's on the line. Be anxious for nothing. I'm losing my eyesight, or my hearing, or my memory. Be anxious for nothing. Bring your problems, your needs, your fears, and leave them with God, Christian. Learn to do this day by day. And it is something we have to learn. Learn to break things down into tasks you can handle each day. Surveying the whole forest may fill you with fear and worry. How am I going to handle this? Looking at the whole thing as one. But if you can chop down two or three trees a day, or I think maybe in these days of environmentally being environmentally friendly, if you can grow two or three trees a day, then you will change the face of the landscape. As I was saying earlier, worry takes you into the future, makes you concerned about things, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be, because the future is not in your hands. Do plan for the future but leave it in the hands of your loving Heavenly Father. Let him do whatever is best. God works all things together for the good of those who love him. He is a Father whose love is total, who knows every little corner of your personality, who controls the universe, and who could bring salvation out of his son's death. Why need you worry with a heavenly father like that? Let's stand as we talk to God together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would help us to take Jesus' words seriously, to consider what care you do take of us, how much more valuable we are than many sparrows, for you have set eternity in our hearts. You have sent your Son 
to be our Saviour. Father, help us to learn not to be anxious by taking one day at a time and seeking with your help to fulfill the tasks for that day. Help us to encourage those who worry and who are not believers to focus on what should be their greatest worry, that you are against them, so that you might save them. And Father, we do pray that the chief desire of every believer here may be to live under your love, under your authority, and to see your kingdom extended in every way possible, morally, geographically in this city, and personally, inwardly, and spiritually too. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close our service by singing part of Psalm 37 together on page 73. We're going to sing stanzas 12 to 14 and then over the page to 18 and 19. And we sing this to the tune Barrow number 49. And if you look at stanza 12, there are serious situations that believers do have to confront. And by Jesus saying, do not worry, it doesn't mean that those situations disappear. The wicked have drawn out the sword and bent their bow to slay the poor and needy. Each day does have its trouble. But as we sing down the psalm, we'll see that God is working for his own. God is working against those who are not his own in stanza 13. And there is something that can't be destroyed in the lives of believers. That's really what, what God is saying in stanza 14. The Lord, the just, sustains. God is sustaining his people. And then in stanza 18, there is a land beyond this one for all who love Jesus. Just look at what God does for his people in stanza 19. God stabilizes us. He holds us tight. He delights in us. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful Savior we have. Let's praise his name in stanzas 12 to 14 and 18 and 19. Again, keeping our seats. fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>